Welcome to our Bible study. I'm Tim Bell. I'm a member of Northside Baptist Church, and we come to you each week telling you and explaining to you some of the scriptures. We've been looking at the book of Revelation for the last three weeks, and today we're going to look at the church that the letter was sent to by John Pergamum. We've looked at Ephesus, and we looked at Smyrna, and now we're going to look at Pergamum. John sent seven letters out to one, each of these churches, one each to seven churches. Seven is the divine number. Remember, this is in apocalyptic literature. And so the, this, uh, the meanings that we find and that we see are hidden. The different numbers and numerals are significant. They all mean something. We talked about last week that 10 was the complete number, and we'll see that again as we go along. They talked about last week as the church suffered would be thrown into prison for 10 days, which meant a complete time. Uh, seven churches, seven lampstands, seven bowls, seven this, seven that. The divine number means God was in control and he was doing these things. But we'll look at some of that a little bit more closely. Um, and so today we're going to look at the church at Pergamum. Now remember, all of these churches are under Roman rule. The Christians are going under persecution. They're being persecuted not only by the Romans, but also by the Jews, because the Christian group is known as a cult, and they are they are accused of different things that they're doing that they're really not doing. But anyway, you know how that goes when a cult shows up. Everybody panics, and everybody wants to get rid of them and, and um, cast as many... Um, cast to them as many, I don't know, uh, you know, make, make them look as bad as you can. And so it was with this particular church, and it was with the other churches too. Uh, Ephesus was a church that was very prominent and very powerful. We looked at that two weeks ago. Last week we looked at Smyrna, which was another important city, and the uh, church that was in there was struggling. We saw that the Christians there in the midst of all the riches that were available were poor because they had been looked down upon and they had suffered affliction because people wouldn't give them jobs, etc. And then we moved to uh, Pergamum. And and uh, I, I have a, f a few things about Pergamum. Let me, let me tell you, just to kind of set the stage and we'll look at them again. But uh, it was the, the entire city was built on a hill and we'll talk about that. The capital city uh, of Asia Minor is the capital city of Asia Minor. So it's a very prominent city. It had the power to pass the death penalty. And when we talk about the sword, which we'll look at, that was kind of uh, reminiscent. Um, as, jo as John wrote this letter, he was, uh, uh, he, he was um, emphasizing the point. We talk about the sword of the Lord, etc., that this also... Uh, was the justice that this particular city was allowed to have of capital punishment, but it was nothing compared to the sword of the Lord. Um, they had the poor, middle class, and wealthy, and they were all grouped together. The poor were in one part of the city, etc. Uh, they had a very important medical center there, and they also had the world's largest library. In fact, parchment comes from the uh, Greek word for Pergamum, and that's where we get that. They had a lot of scrolls there and they sent them to Egypt because in Egypt, there was a, in Alexandria, it was the biggest library in the world. But um, unfortunately, the library was burned. And so we lost all kinds of important information that we could have had about some of those civilizations. Uh, but anyway, uh, we'll, we'll look then at Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. And John is, is writing the, these letters, and they've been sent out to the seven churches. They've been written in hidden language so that the Romans couldn't read what John was saying and understand it. If he would have put on there that the Roman government was going to be overthrown and that God was going to be in charge, they would never have let the letters get out. And so they didn't really see the importance of them. But the Jewish people and the Christian people who received the letters, they understood what John was saying. Uh, we're not going to get into that as in the latter books of, of uh, Revelation, but at, l at least, you know, in, in some of these, we can look at them here. Uh, we, we saw in Revelation chapter 1 that uh, Jesus Christ is the one that's actually giving the words to John uh, and people, Christians with the spiritual heart, 
uh, with the spiritual mind are able to discern what it is that Jesus is telling his people through John. So, so let, let's look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, and let's have a quick word of prayer. We give you thanks, Lord, for the glory you give us. Thank you, Father, for giving us confidence and giving us the truth that we know that we'll stand with you, not only on this earth, but in all eternity. Thank you, Lord, for the confidence that you bestowed upon these people. And we pray that you would give us the encouragement also as we live our Christian lives. May we walk boldly with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Uh, he says that write the angel of the church in Pergamum. Thus says the one who has the sharp double-edged sword. So the one that's talking is Jesus. He has a sharp double-edged sword. That was the swords that the Romans used. They were kind of short. They were sharp on both sides. Uh, they were very good using these, very efficient and well in warfare. And they could use them to slaughter the enemy quite easily. And so the Roman uh, sword was important to the way that the Romans did battle and it was a scourge to the enemy he says um, and then he goes on he says I know where you live where Satan's throne is now Pergamum was a city built on a hill as I've already said to you and Zeus was the basic uh, god that people worshiped there and there was a huge statue of Zeus and you could and people said that you could see it for miles around so they could see that there was a city on a hill and you had this a statue of this big god Zeus that was that everybody would see and go to worship. Uh, he he calls it here. John calls it Satan's throne. Satan's throne. Uh, then he says, um, "Yet you are holding on to my name, and you do not deny your faith, because your faith has been strong, and you didn't give up on me. You continue to proclaim me." He says, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death among you where Satan lives. Because of the statue of Zeus there, they also had a big statue of the emperor, which kind of led to the conclusion that there was a lot of emperor worship that went on. When Caesar came into a town or a village, people were expected to proclaim Caesar as Lord. That was just kind of standard procedure. That was like the, uh, you know, saying, how Hitler, Caesar's Lord. Uh, not all people would say that. The Jews wouldn't say it, but they were not condemned for it because they condemned the Christians because the Jews kept the Christians in line. And so as a reward somewhat, that Rome said, well, okay, you don't have to say Jesus as Lord, but the Christians do. And so when the Christians would not say that, when they would not say uh, I didn't mean Jesus is Lord, I meant Caesar is Lord. So when the Christians would not say Caesar is Lord, only Jesus is Lord, they would be put to death or thrown in prison or whatever it may be. They had faced the consequences. And so it is that, that uh, you know, he's uh, John saying, you, you did not deny your faith in me. You know, you, you held firm. And we look into our own lives and we see opportunities that we have to tell others about Christ and to serve him. Yet we don't, and we deny Jesus like Peter denied Jesus. And we deny Jesus uh, in the sense that we don't really stand for him like he wants us to, like he's called us to, like he gives us strength to, to the Holy Spirit. And the scriptures teach us that no matter what kind of situation we get into, if we don't know what we're supposed to say, the Holy Spirit will tell us. And so if you get in those situations where you really don't know how to say or how to approach it, uh, just boldly step into it and let the Holy Spirit take part of your life and he'll show you and tell you what you need to do. And so it is here in Pergamum that uh, um individual named Antipas apparently stood for the Lord. He was very uh, he, he was very much a solid Christian. He would not deny Christ. Um, he's just happened probably maybe they were using that as an example or something else that he would not say Caesar's Lord and so they put him to death. And so um, that's what James, you know, John, John's heard about this. John knows that this happened. And so he's telling the people that even though they are living in a town, in a city that is ruled basically by Zeus and by the emperor because of their statues, there would be this worship that would go along with it. And yet um, these people, they, they were not worried by that. They did not deny Jesus, did not deny his name. 
And that's a great thing that they can say. Not everybody can say that. And that's a great victory that this church had. Okay, so, so looking then at um, uh, verse 14, he says, but I have a few things against you. You know, most of these, except for one, Jesus always had something against the churches. First, he told of the good things they did. And then he said, but, you know, you do have some areas that you need to improve in. Isn't that the way it is with all of us Christians? Hopefully, most of the things we do are acceptable by God. But, you know, we all fall short. And so God gives us, uh, um, through his Holy Spirit, he gives us divine guidance. And he shows us where we're falling short and what we need to do to stand firm for him. And so he says, but I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam who taught Balak to place a stumbling block in front of the Israelites, to eat meat sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. In the same way, you also had those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans or Nicolaitans. Now, if you remember the story of Balaam, it took place in Numbers, I think it was chapter 15. And Balaam, he was um, seen as a prophet, you know, uh, of, of the particular people in Moab or around that area. And the Israelites had gained a lot of strength and they were heading toward Moab. And the king Balak, he was afraid of what the Israelites might do to his city. And so he told Balaam to go put a curse on him. And so Balaam did actually go out to meet him and to put a curse on him. But you remember, this is the story where the donkey spoke to Balaam and told him not to do it. And so he didn't do it. He did not curse Israel. He went out to curse them, I think, three times, but all three times he didn't do it. He failed to do it. But Balaam didn't want to be in disfavor with Balak. So what he did was is that he did allow and he did present to the people, to the Israelites, Baal worship. It was a worship that they used prostitutes in order to carry out the worship. And so he uh, introduced the Israelites to Baal, which was a, a terrible downfall that that plagued them the rest of their existence while they in, in the ancient world as they were trying to move forward. It was always Baal getting in the way. And so this stumbling block that that Balaam put in front of the people is mentioned here. And he says, and John says, you know, you some of you people are falling under that curse that Baal or that Balaam put on you concerning prostitute worship. Some of you people are worshiping. Some of you Christians are worshiping, you know, you know, sexually with prostitutes, and you know that's not pleasing to God. And then he said, and also you are eating food that has been worshipped to idols. Now Paul says that it's okay to eat food worshipped to idols, it, it, because the idols are not, you know, in reality or anything. But he said, if it causes a stumbling block for other Christians, then don't do it. And so here is a particular case to where the Christians were eating this meat uh, and it was a stumbling block for other Christians and so in that case it was wrong for them to do the you always need to put love before you put uh, you know the legalistic law another way of looking at also is the fact that in Paul in Corinthians when Paul was talking about it it was just meat that had been offered up to to to, to the gods and then it was it was put in on the meat market and people just bought it and ate it you know they didn't really even know that it was necessarily offered up to these gods, you know, what have you, and it was irrelevant. But here, it seems to indicate that this is the actual meat that was worshipped, that it was used in worship, and as a part of that worship service to these gods, they ate the meat. So it was in a little bit different vein in which they see this occurring. And so this was a stumbling block for the Christians. And then another thing that they're doing, it says not only of you, uh, eating meat sacrificed to idols, and but you're uh, committing to to sexual immorality, which we talked about also. And then they also hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Now, the teachings of the Nicolaitans were somewhat like the um, oh, the Gnostics or or some of the other other groups that had kind of filtered in. And what it said was is that it really doesn't make any difference what you do in the physical sense because you will be cleansed in the spiritual sense. So in other words, you can go ahead and, and engage in prostitution and whatever else you want to do, but you're okay. You're saved from that because spiritually you are with Christ. You are with the Lord. 
it's called like, um, I heard it called uh, the two sheets theory that you can have clean sheets, even though you dirty one sheet, but you can still have clean sheets and that's acceptable. And people would buy into that, you know, and that would be a natural thing to do. I mean, if you can go out into the world and be promiscuous and do whatever you want to do, and you know that no matter what you do, it doesn't make any difference because spiritually you're not sinning, you're just sinning physically, it's not going to be held against you. Well, we know that's not what the Christian doctrine teaches us. We know that the Christian faith says that spiritually and physically, we're all one. You know, we are, we are, our souls are physical and spiritual and we're all God's temple. And so anything we do uh, with one has effects on the other. So you had this uh, group that came in and that would be like, say, a, a very uh, good group in which to join because you can have your cake and eat it too. And so he was telling, so John was telling the people, even though that you've done some good things and you haven't denied me and, 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 and you, you're willing to give your life for that, you're a martyr, you're, re you're ready for martyrdom. Some of the things that you have done I hold against you. And it was these basic things here uh, about prostitution and eating meat and that sacrifice to the idols and, and, uh, and, and accepting and absorbing the religion of the Nicolaitans. Okay, so now we're going to move on with uh, with the last section. And let me mention before I go on with that, they had a God there uh, for, for medicine, a God of healing. And a God was like two snakes that was wrapped around a, a pole, like two serpents wrapped around a pole. And if you uh, look on uh, a lot of medical uh, papers today or a lot of medical symbols or when you go into a medical building or hospital building you'll see that symbol sometimes and that's a carryover from the Greek God and that is that is the God that they worship the two serpents in the in the staff and uh, I thought that was kind of an interesting point I mean when you see that in the hospital what have you that doesn't mean that the hospital worships false gods or anything that's just the symbol of the medical profession and that's how it was handed down because it was used as a symbol of this great city in the medical field and the um, importance of medicine that the city had in Pergamum. Okay, so um, ch chapter 2, verse 16, it says, that, So repent, otherwise I will come quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So uh, Jesus uses this idea of sword of my mouth again. It's this power it's the power of Rome for capital punishment. But now we see this power as James is, as John is telling the people, Rome doesn't have that power. Jesus does. And he's going to come with that power. Everybody's afraid of the power of capital punishment, afraid of, of what the Romans can do with their broadswords. But Jesus can do things even greater with the broadsword. And so, so you know, how, 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 how important that is. Okay, now I'm back with you. I had to take off for just a minute. You may have heard my dog bark. He had to go outside. So I had to take a break and let him out real quick. Uh, so anyway, uh, we're on um, verse 17. He, uh, he says, Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. So again, John is telling the people that they're not going to be able to listen to this just with their minds only. And look at it in a secular way, but their spirit it has to listen to what the words are. So that not only do they understand the words, but they can apply them. So he says, listen to what Jesus is telling you. Listen to what these words are telling you that I'm sending to you in these letters. Let the spirit work in your life and through your heart and through your mind, your spiritual mind, d discern what's going on here and understand. Uh, so he says, if you have ears, uh, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. So the ones who are able to overcome the denials and the persecutions and the temptations of the Roman world, those who overcome and remain faithful to God, to those he's going to give the hidden manna. Now the hidden manna is uh, the manna that was given 
of course, in the desert, remember to the people that sustained them, it came daily. They never got extra amounts of it. It came daily and sustained them all the time they were in the desert. And they learned to have faith on God. Uh, faith. They, they learned to yeah, have, have faith and to trust God. There was a, um, you know, kind of a lore that Jeremiah had some of this manna and it was put aside. And when the time came in the last days that he would come out with this manna, and he will give that to the people to sustain them through going through all this turmoil and persecution. Now, whether or not, you know, you know that's, that's really the, the case, which it probably wasn't. That was just, you know, what, that's not scriptural. That's just what people, some of the people thought. Um, the, the, the point is the manna that he's talking about is it will sustain. It's what God is going to use to sustain you through each day of persecution. It's not going to be physical bread or physical manna. It's going to be God's uh, power and the confidence that you can have to the Holy Spirit. Um, and then it says, not only will I give some of you the hidden manna, but I'll also give you a white stone. Now, uh, a white stone, uh, as most of you have seen or heard about uh, in, in some of the uh, older days and even the newer days, a lot of times you hear the term somebody got blackballed. So somebody comes into a um, meeting or into a particular group of people and they want to be a member. And so they vote. And the way they vote is they put a marble or a stone into a box and they pull them out. I remember an Annie Griffith episode where somebody wanted to be a member of the lodge and they did that. They put the marbles in. There's a Harvard spray who wanted to be a member. And, and uh, so they, they pulled the marbles out and... And if, if there was one black ball in there, then he would not be able to join. So, I mean, there were like, you know, 10 white ones and one black one. And that ended up being his mother because she didn't want him to be gone at night. And she snuck a, um, a marble in. That's, you just have to watch it. I can't go into all the details of that. But the point is that if you get a white stone, you're accepted. And if you get a black stone, you're rejected. And so you're going to get a white stone. Not only are you going to get the hidden manna, but you're going to get a white stone, which means you're accepted into the family of God. And a white stone meaning that you are um, invited to the final dinner that Revelation talks about that we'll all enjoy. Um, and so it says the white stone. And on that stone, a new name is inscribed that no one knows except the one who receives it. So there's a new name inscribed on this white stone. Now, there's there's not total agreement on exactly what they're talking about there, but I think that it's it's fairly evident that what they're talking about is when you become a Christian, you know, we get a new name. Uh, you don't get a new physical name or anything, but you get a new name. A name in the Old Testament, a name in the New Testament in Jewish tradition was your whole being. It was everything. And if you had a bad name, you know, people who have bad reputations, they're looked down upon. And so in this particular case, not only do you get the hidden man and not only do you get the white stone, but you get a new name, a new name, which is a name of respect, a new name, which is one that describes how you overcame and, and did not deny Christ and did not lay in sin with the prostitutes and fall, fall into the Roman culture. And so you have a new name. You have a new name, a name that you couldn't earn on your own, that nobody gave to you. Only Jesus Christ gave it to you because you made those decisions to accept him and to all and to uh, also accept a new name that goes along with that. And so that's what, uh, you know, those uh, final verses there are talking about. OK, so let's let's just kind of sum up things here. Um, Pergamum was was a church. It was a prominent church uh, in the sense that it was in a prominent city. The church was poor just like it was in the, the second church in Smyrna we talked about. The people were rich, but the church people were poor because of persecution and they call an affliction that was going on by the other people. Some of the same things that Christians endure today, not so much in America, but around the world, it's much worse. There's much persecution against Christians, you know, et cetera. In fact, if you look um, in, in, in some of the statistics, there are more martyrs today than, it ever, than, than in any time in the past. Um, and so people are still struggling with this. They're still trying to do the best that they can. Uh, and, and yet whenever they do not deny Christ and when they um, 
you know, are, are encouraged by the Holy Spirit when they listen to the words that John gives to them through this. It lifts them up and helps them. And this particular church, there were people that did not deny Jesus. I'm sure there were some that did. But the main point here is that he was happy that they did not deny Jesus. However, their works were not what, they're, what they should be. They were involved in some things. And we're like that, even if we accept Christ into our lives. We know that sin doesn't pull us apart from Jesus as far as taking away our salvation. Only, only you know, we decide to walk away. It's not anything that Jesus does or that the devil does or anybody else because we are firm in the hand of God. Uh, and yet, you know, we do slip and we do bad things and we do some immoral things and we do do some things that are not acceptable. And yet God forgives us for that because he gave us a new name. He gives us a white stone of acceptance. He gives us a new name to where we are, uh, uh, you know, not our own creature, we're not our own self, but instead we have the name that he has for us, the name that we use to walk with him. And so you can see this particular church had its problems, but in general, they were in pretty good shape as far as what Jesus said to them. And so it is with you and with, uh, with, with me, whenever we go to the Lord in prayer and we ask him to forgive us of our sins, we're made aware of what those sins are, but we know that he does forgive us of them because he is loving and he is gracious and he is, um, and he is, um, you know, without fault. And he promised that he would take away our sins. And so when you go to him and confess them and you ask him into your life as personal Lord and Savior, uh, then he does and he gives you eternal life from that point on. And then when we sin, even though we're a Christian, God forgives us for those sins and continues to give us new life so that we can walk in strength as a Christian. And we're not pushed aside or, or our power, our strength, our example is not pushed down because of sin and because of the way that we live. And so it is with this particular church, and so it is with us. We can fit right in with that. That letter could come to us just as easy. And so we look at what James, I'm sorry, I always say James. It shows what John has done through Jesus Christ as he has told him what to say. And so that's the first three churches. We have four more to go, and we'll cover those in the next weeks. So let's uh, let's be uh, dismissed in prayer, closed in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for loving us even though we deny you. We thank you, Lord, for loving us even though we get involved with activities and morality that we shouldn't. We thank you, Lord, that you forgive us because you love us and because you have mercy and showed us mercy and have walked with us. So thank you, Lord, for this time together to serve and to study. Help us to go into the world and be a true Christian. It helps us to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the power that you give us to do that and for the power of love we have for him and for one another. May the world see the love in our lives and may affect their lives and let them know that Jesus is number one with us and can be for them as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.